Hello and welcome to our vlog for this afternoon. This is Teacher April or Teacher Apps. And this is a webinar on the Philippine Biodiversity Issues, Challenges, and Initiatives. So for this afternoon, I am going to share this slide for you. This is uh, something that I wanted to share as well. So I hope you can bear with me. And for the participants who are watching this one, please feel free to have the evaluation after watching this webinar. So thank you so much for being here. And let's start our webinar for this afternoon. Okay. Right, so let me just type screen and there we go. All right, so hello, good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar on the Philippine Biodiversity Issues, Challenges, and Initiatives. So for this afternoon, we are going to talk about these things, and let's try to know more. So in this webinar, I would like to acknowledge my EdSci course professor, Dr. Michelle Akledan for uh, giving us the opportunity to have this webinar and for us to conduct and act as well as part of the sharing that we have about biodiversity and on environmental science. So I would be your speaker for this afternoon. I am teacher April G. Tahan, and I've been to several experiences, both online and offline classes. And I've been to private school before and online classes or online teaching. And currently, I am in pri uh, public school right now. So I attended several trainings, seminars, and so many more. Okay. So I am a graduate of biological science major. And for this webinar, the participants are most likely expected to discuss the present situation of our ecosystem management, conservation of natural resources, and environmental resource management. And they are going to explain the different environmental policies in the Philippines. And we're going to share and reflect the conservation of natural and environmental resources in the Philippines. Okay. So this is how we are going to do it. And for our topics for this afternoon, we are going to discuss about biodiversity and environment and environmental issues, challenges, and policies, conservation of natural resources, and the environmental resource management. Okay, so let's get started. So who are the participants of this webinar? The expected participants of this webinar are the science teachers, both in public schools, teaching in public schools, and teaching in private schools, okay? And let's talk about this one. Okay, so to start with, we are going to have our PowerPoint. This is a PowerPoint coming from the Department of Environment, okay? and natural resources or dnr together with the uh, biodiversity management bureau or the bmb so i got this powerpoint in slide share and i would just like to make use of this powerpoint and also give some inputs about the following things that i have learned from this output okay so philippine biodiversity issues challenges and initiatives let's talk about these things and let's go so let me show you a video first, and I want you to listen carefully to this video because this is very helpful to all of us, okay? So this is from the Philippines. One favorite destination, their favorite destination, his too. This is the Philippines. This 
is mega diverse Philippines in an equally diverse region of Southeast Asia. The Philippines is one of the world's 17 mega diversity countries, which hosts 70% of the entire planet species in its ecosystems and rich resources. Home to more than 52,177 described species, more than half of which are found nowhere else in the world. Home to endemic plants and animals. No wonder the Philippines ranks significantly in the world in terms of the number of unique species per unit area. The Philippines also geographically marks the apex of the Coral Triangle, the center of marine biodiversity worldwide. Its coral reef area run to an estimate of 26,000 square kilometers, the second largest in Southeast Asia. Its coastal waters home to a wider range of corals, reef fishes, seagrasses, and mangroves. This is mega diverse Philippines and it gets even significantly richer with Benham Rice, a Philippine continental shelf of mesophotic reefs. The dugong, the whale, marine turtles, shark, manta rays, fish, and water birds. It is no surprise that in their migratory path, the Philippines is an important destination. As a party to the CMS, here their conservation is a commitment. A commitment shared with other CMS parties. Here, they breed and forage in the rich marine wetlands and forest ecosystems. Here, their migratory site is protected. An important habitat of thousands of migratory birds within the East Asian Australasian Flyway. Several of which are internationally critical for conservation of migratory water birds. An important home in their migration. The world's biggest fish, the whale shark, or butanding, also finds home in the archipelago. While largely pelagic or deep water dwellers, the gentle giants occasionally gather near shore for feeding. While in Philippine waters, their sanctuaries, they too are protected. Come, Dubong! Come, whales and turtles! You birds and butanding! Come to the cradle of bountiful biodiversity beyond boundaries. Your breath is the world's breath. Welcome to the Philippines. All right. Wow, that was a very nice video coming from our Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Thank you so much, DNR and BMB, for that uh, video. So this that that video was actually coming from them, and I really appreciate the uh, entrance ceremony of the uh, twelve an uh, annual representation of the dnr here in the philippines okay so let's try to discuss first our philippines ecosystem and uh, what is really an ecosystem here in the philippines and is it rich is it poor is, are we really in a poor country because many people would always say we're on the third world country so we're poor but actually that's not true okay the philippines is a country rich in biodiversity and endemism Okay, with many natural resources. Okay, so that means from the habitats of animals to different kinds of species, these are all significant. I mean, its shorelines and coastal habitats are of particular importance with fisheries, agriculture, and industry all dependent on the country's waterways and marine environment. And the threats to habitat and biodiversity loss come from various practices, including land clearing, unsustainable fishing, and pollution. Okay, so I guess that's one of the things that we have to consider in our ecosystem. But to tell you the truth that Philippines is such a rich country and we are a multi-diverse country with many kinds of um natural resources and when we say endemism endemism means it's a state of uh, 
of ecological state, I mean, of species um, being on a native, all right, from native to defined geographic location. Okay, so there's a there's a lot of things that we can see because we have 7,000 plus islands here in the Philippines and we are an archipelagic, archipelagic country. So I guess this is very an advantage for different organisms to live, thrive, and survive. Okay, so here are some of the pictures of the animals and species that we have here in the Philippines. We are really rich in terrestrial and marine as well as in floral and fauna, okay, so, and other species that we can find, okay. So we all depend on biodiversity to, to survive, but what is biodiversity? Bio means life, of course, when we say bio, that's life, and diversity means different kinds or variety. Okay, so what is biodiversity? When we say biodiversity, that means variations of life, or meaning different kinds of life forms. There's a variety of life in a set of a natural environment from the smallest microorganism to the largest mammal, including the ecosystems where they live, the forest, mountains, rivers, and so many more, seas. So there's a variety of species. That's biodiversity. But there are three kinds of levels of biodiversity. So we, the first level is what we call genetic diversity. This refers to the uniqueness of every living organism that refers to our genes. So the inheritance that is passed towards a different creature from different creature. Okay, so we have another thing, which is the species diversity. When we refer to species diversity, this refers to the measured in terms of the total number of species found in a particular area. So is in short, in Davao City, what are the species that are abundant? What are the, you know, the fruits, the flowers that are abundant, okay? And we have also ecosystem diversity. So this self-sustaining collection of organisms and habitat like the forest, the rivers, the mangroves, marine wetlands, and so many more. So that refers to ecosystem diversity. And here in the Philippines, we have a lot of that, okay? So biodiversity is referred to as the web of life because as you can see here, that is a, in the picture, it's like a food chain. So when the birds pick up seeds and drop them in, on a rich soil enriched by ants and microorganisms, the seeds grows into a variety of trees and then it becomes a forest. And then from forest and mountains provides aqua aquifer or the source of fresh water okay so it creates mountains and then man eats fruits from trees and drops seeds and birds and other pollinators pick up the seeds again and the cycle continues so this is the web of life okay and i guess this is really how biodiversity takes place okay so what do we benefit in our biodiversity not only in the philippines but also around the world so when we talk about biodiversity, it feeds the world for so many people through livestock, okay? So there's a total number of 10,000 species, okay? Humans had over 10,000 species for food. And today about 30 crops provide our body's energy requirements. So that's um, 40 species of mammals and birds domesticated for food and 14 species accounted for 90 percent of the livestock production also aside from giving us food biodiversity provides air and water for us with the help of the trees the forests generate oxygen that we breathe and they take in carbon dioxide for us to have oxygen okay so for us to have a clean air okay so this is something that we need to discuss also. So there are some laws abiding to this, and I hope we can follow um, in the discussion process on this webinar. Okay. So biodiversity also provides materials for clothing and shelter. Of course, without trees and without other materials, okay, plants like fiber, timber, bamboo, kogon, anahaw, rattan, we can never do any materials or we cannot build some shelters and you know have some clothings like 
the one that we're wearing right now. So without them, without biodiversity, we cannot provide all of those things. Okay, next is biodiversity heals, of course. So about 80% of the world's biodiversity resources with medicinal values are in forests. Okay, so most likely all of the medicines that are coming from the forests. So in short, if uh, teachers also print modules, there's a lot of trees that are dying every single day. So the world loses around 13 million hectares. You know, imagine that 13 million hectares of forest cover every year. And then that is happening in reality. So cone snail living in corals is a source of medicine for cancer pain. Okay, so that's around 88% of ASEAN's corals that are at risk. And one of the beautiful corals here in the Philippines um, is already being, you know, abused by some people or probably from, uh, from other countries or somehow the people who are in stable in that specific place who throw their gar garbage, their trash, everything that they have, you know, it's something that we have to build in to ourselves and that is discipline. Okay, and biodiversity brings income to millions. So imagine if our livestock is rich, our forest is rich, our, our, our marine animals are rich. Imagine how many livelihood could it bring to many people. So livelihood like selling of fishes, fruits and vegetables, furniture making and wood carving, pearl farming, livestock raising and selling, these are all forms of livelihood programs like forestry, agriculture and fisheries, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, and ecotourism. This would add millions to the current state here in the Philippines and would take furthermore for other people to, you know, to have income and to educate themselves furthermore. Okay, so biodiversity, aside from having livelihood programs, it could bring to, you know, an income to people. It could also bring us a lot of benefits on rural in rural areas, especially for farmers and for fishermen. So around 80% of the ASEAN's rural poor's income is derived from biodiversity. Remember, without farmers, without fishermen, you know, farms, um, poultry, livestock, these people are the ones who feed us. And for those who cannot understand the factors that they are struggling right now especially right now that we're experiencing covid 19 pandemic so the sales somehow had brought down because the needs somehow are lesser compared to the normal days that we're, where we have um you know an income which is stable or standard so for this time they are asked somehow to have a minimum wage but there are some laws that could actually you know fight for these and especially for rice farmers because there is already an existing law regarding the rice okay rice taxation but i don't know if the farmers are happy on that law right now because they cannot actually feel it according to some news articles that i have read and i hope that they are doing safe and good right now so biodiversity suits okay this is something that is very beneficial for all because in uh, biodiversity does not only give us food, does not give us shelter, does not give us income or so many, but it gives us peace of mind. And this is something that cannot be bought by any other country, whether they would buy us or not. This is something that is inherited and is a gift. It's a blessing coming from our ancestors and from, it's a gift from God to 
treasure and to take care of this one because we can do nature tripping, mountain climbing, bird wa watching, sorry for that, enjoying the beach or the verdant forests, comfort in nature, and hearing the joyful chirping of birds, watching puppy play, something that inspires an artist along with his masterpieces. And that's something that I really like about. Okay, so what services do we get from our ecosystems? Aside from the benefits that we get from our biodiversity, there are some services that we can actually avail from this ecosystem. So in we have four kinds. We have provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural. In terms of provisioning, of course, these are the necessities like the production of food, air, water, including purification of air, you know, regulating, stabilization of climate, control of diseases, detoxification and decomposition of waste, creation of drainage systems, you know, supporting, we have nutrient cycling, crop pollination, soil fertilization. These are very understandable somehow because it is something that we, we are experiencing. Okay, so... These are very common and especially for cultural aspects because it can affect us socially, spiritually, and even on our mental state because it gives us the drive to do recreational activities. And this recreational activities has its benefits for us to improve ourselves and, you know, to have our socialization to others and to know more about ourselves. Okay, so we have in here wetlands and mangroves. So as you can see in the picture, all right, let me just try to have my pointer and, okay. So we have in here um, a wetland area. So this is a wetland area and you can see on the other side, there are some mangroves, okay. These mangroves, okay, have its own purpose, okay. So why are they here and why mangroves withstand most likely in wetland area. That's why it's very important to plant trees like mangroves in wetland areas because they can actually grow well or grow better in that kind of environment or in that kind of state. So mangroves actually provides timber and other vegetation for human use and it maintains uh, the fishes for breeding grounds and nurseries, and it stores the surface water and reduces flood damage. This is very important. It recharges underground aquifers, so it has um, fresh water, okay, and filters and recycles the nitrogen and potassium released by human activity into water. It maintains plant and animal microbial biodiversity. This is very important because this uh, this is referring to decomposition and fertil uh, the fertility of the soil or the fertilization in, in the soil. And of course, it provides outdoor recreation, education, and ecotourism. So it, it would have an impact both in industrial, agricultural, and ecotourism aspect. Okay, so that's it. All right, so how about in forest ecosystems? The earlier, that's wetland ecosystem. This time, how about the forest ecosystem? What does it bring to us humans or for us people here in the Philippines? Okay, or if not in other countries. So in forest ecosystems, okay, forest trees and plants store carbon and helps slow human, you know, can use to lessen to slow down the global climate change. And of course, the deep forest soils store large volumes of water. Forest soils purify water acting as massive filters, okay? Forestry roots bind soils and help prevent erosion. This is very important because if there are landslides, okay, so it withstands the soil firmer somehow, okay? Forest provides goods such as food, timber, and medicines. This is very known. And don't you know that forest canopy purifies air by filtering particulates and providing chemical reaction sites where pollutants are detoxified? And that is how it is. Okay, so most likely it is used for paper, for other purposes. 
But the most important thing is they are habitat for plants, animals, and microbes. And they maintain water cycle to stabilize the local climate. Okay, so that's it. Now let's go to our marine ecosystem. Now in marine ecosystem, there are what we call benefits or the purposes of this ecosystem. And what does it do? So the purpose of this is that it maintains marine plant, animal, and microbial biodiversity provides fish and other marine fauna habitat. This is very important because this is where they will live for a long time and breed. So it provides fish and breeding grounds, nurseries, filters and recycles nitrogen and, you know, um, potassium released by human activity into water and provides outdoor recreation, education and ecotourism, sequesters carbon. All right. Or what do you call when we say sequesters carbon? That means they absorb carbon and turn it into oxygen. All right. They convert it into a form of oxygen. All right. So let's go. And don't you know that the ecosystem services in Southeast Asia valued at over 2.2 billion US dollars? This is the ASEAN TEEB 2012 that happened. And it has been discussed through this time. So that's how important and that's how expensive our ecosystem is here in Southeast Asia. So do you agree in this picture? Now look at the picture carefully and tell me if you agree. Biodiversity is life. Biodiversity is our life. Is this true? The thing is, yes. Because, you know, biodiversity gives us everything that we need. And I've stated earlier that gives us shelter, clothes, cure us, food, it gives us food and water from biodiversity and provides livelihood for us. Okay, so how rich is our biodiversity here in the Philippines? Now, Philippines has nature's superpower. And let's try to look at the facts and the figures why Philippines is one of the multi um level developed multi diverse uh, country in terms of its um you know biodiversity and the ecosystem that it has all right so let's start first with mount makiling mount makiling contains more through a tree okay i'm so sorry for that contains more a uh, tree the tree species than the whole continental United States. Don't you know that? That this land area is 32 times bigger than the Philippines. And that's really how Mount Makiling is. Okay. Another thing is the Philippines is second in the world in terms of butterfly species. Are you, aren't you proud of that? So we are the second in the world in terms of endemicity. Okay, so when they say endemicity, the ecological state of, of a species being native to a single defined geographic location. So that's around 895 species and there are 352 are endemic. Okay. Oh, and we have also our Tamarau. Okay, this is fifth in the world in mammalian endemicity. And of its 183 species, 120 or 66% are endemic. And we have also the eighth, right, in the world. These are our alligators, okay? Okay, so um, the biggest alligators in the world are also found here in the Philippines. Okay, it's eighth in the world in reptilian species and demicity of its 252, uh, 258, I'm sorry, 258 species, 170 or 66% are endemic. Oh, and we have the forest frog or the polilio forest frog. There are 171 species of amphibians in the Philippines and 78% of these are endemics. Of course, truly yours from Davao City, we have Philippine Eagle. Also in Manila, they also have a sanctuary for Philippine Eagles. And don't you know that the Philippine Eagle is the largest eagle of the world? Yes. And we have the biggest and the largest Philippine Eagle, the world's largest eagle of all. Okay. So this is uh, why we should be proud of our country. 
Okay, and also there are 54 species of mangroves in the world and 40 species of these are found only in the Philippines. That's it. And also we have 500 of the 800 plus known coral species in the world, which is found only in our country. And that's why many countries wanted to, you know, to dominate Philippines because Philippines is such a rich country in terms of its agriculture, marine life, terrestrial life, wetland ecosystem, and so many more forest areas okay so philippine biodiversity is around 18 is one of the 18 mega diverse countries okay so it has more than 52,177 described species half of which are endemic found nowhere else in the world but only here in the philippines why are we in great danger that's also one of the reasons why we are in great danger because since we are a multidiverse ecosystem and we have this multidiverse biodiversity here in the Philippines, the thing is we are on the hotspots and the hottest of the hotspots is we have actually 35. We're on the Pacific Ring of Fire and we have 35 hotspots in the world. So on a per unit area basis, the Philippines is the top mega diversity country and the hottest of the hotspots of all. But even though it's hot in here, our ecosystem is thriving and changing sometimes. So I guess this is what you call climate change. And the thing is depletion of the Philippine biodiversity happens mm, from 1918. So this is a record from 1918. So mangrove forests, 149,000 hectares remain from the original 450,000 hectares in 1918. See that? And also from wetlands, more than half of the country's wetlands of international importance covering 14,000 square kilometers are threatened. And in 1935, this is a very late update there were 17 million hectares of forest today and there are only 6 million hectares left okay so now since we have those problems and those issues it's time for us to talk about some of the policies that we have to follow and we have also to determine why is it very important for us to do this okay so there are major environmental laws and we have also the official gazette laws here in the philippines the animal welfare and wildlife laws, which are we are going to discuss right now. Okay, so let's talk about first the Republic Act 9003 or the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act of 2000. So this Republic Act, or in partnership with the stakeholders, the law aims to adopt a systematic, comprehensive, and ecological solid waste management program that shall ensure the protection of public health and environment. The law ensures proper segregation, collection, storage, treatment, and disposal of solid waste through the formulation and adaptation of best eco-waste products. Okay, so this is the Republic Act or RA-9003. So we have also RA or Republic Act 9275, which is the Philippine Clean Water Act of 2004. Of course, this law aims to protect the country's water bodies from pollution from land-based sources. So can you imagine the Boracay? This is one of the best examples because Boracay is actually a very beautiful beach. Uh, when livelihoods started and tourism started, everything changed there in Boracay. And it seems that most of the polluted parts are seen in the coastal areas of Boracay. And because of our uh, initiative, initiative of the government and the, with the help of our president, um, the DNR was able to establish back the, you know, the beauty and the serenity of the beach. And I guess this is something that should be done from the very first place because humans are the ones who use and abuse as well the you know the scenery the environment that we have so this is something that we need to adjust to so the water was found 
in some of the beaches that are polluted and it is highly consumed with sodium. So all of the waste products are also found in the beach or coastlines. And this was also observed by the Department of um, Environment and Natural Resources. So by that time, the DTI also, you know, made some changes and implemented for the local government to work or the LGUs to help also in the cleanliness of the area there in Boracay. And I'm very glad because it's very nice now. Next is the Republic Act 8749. So the, this is the Philippine Clean Air Act of 1999. So this law aims to achieve and maintain clean air that meets national air quality guideline values for criteria pollutants throughout the Philippines. All right, so I guess this is understandable that there are some, okay, vehicles as well are being monitored through the smoke that their vehicles are releasing. So there is also what we call an act for that. So it is abided by the LTO or the Land Transportation Office. So they are the ones who monitors this RA or this law to some of the vehicles that we have right now. Next is Republic Act 6969, which refers to the Toxic Substances or Hazardous and Nuclear Waste Control Act of 1990. This is most likely um, to factories. So a factory cannot operate unless this law is abided. Okay, so the law aims to regulate, restrict, or prohibit the import importation or manufacture processing or the sale or the distribution of any kinds of materials or use unless this law disposes the chemical substances properly. So if there are some chemical substances that are not disposed properly and it, it is a mixture that is risk to human health, is prohibited to do such thing in that locality or in that place. So factories should be aware also to the smoke that they release in that locality. If it's hazardous to many citizens in the area, in the community, so they should stop and the barangay officials should really strengthen something and do about it. Okay, next is the Presidential Decree 1586. We have the env Environmental Impact Statement or the EIS Statement of 1978. This is the Environment Impact Assessment that was formally established in 1978 with the enactment of the Presidential Decree number 1586. What is the purpose of this? This is to attain and maintain the rational and order balance between socioeconomic development and environmental protection. So the EIA or the um, the planning and managing, uh, the one who plans or manage so in the environment impact assessment, okay? So this one helps the government to have some decisions in accordance to affecting communities that addresses the negative consequences or risks on the environment and the process assures the implementation of environment-friendly projects only. Okay, so that's it. Next is, of course, we will not forget our Republic Act number 8485. This is known as the Animal Welfare Act of 1998, which also protects our animals from livestock to pets, everything about it. So especially those um, endangered species, okay? And we have also the Republic Act number 9147, an act providing for the conservation and protection of wildlife resources and their habitats, appropriating funds, therefore, and for other purposes. So anything that is um, illegal, legally transported or illegally bought, um, the RA9147 is the one who will, you know, protect these animals or wildlife animals by law. So I hope the people as well in the, you know, in the offices of the government or somehow the officials would also do the same and would follow the same law strictly. 
Okay, so there are some threats to biodiversity and we're done already to our issues, challenges, and policies. This time, let's talk about the overview biodiversity loss in the Philippines. It is actually caused by climate change. Have you observed that climate change is likely to become the dominant direct driver of biodiversity loss by the end of the century? And most likely, drought happens and El Nino, El Nina, okay, so this happens every year. Especially in the Philippines, there are around 20 typhoons that come to our, 20 to 25 typhoons come to our country every year. And it's not actually something new. It's actually getting normal for many people and for the citizens. But in aspect of our climate change, this range is quite predictable but some are unpredictable especially of the incident that happened for the past few years ago <laughs> okay so let's have the climate change okay so that's it and it's 50 percent of biodiversity is always at risk in asia and as much as 88 percent of coral reefs may be lost in the next 30 years as a result of climate change okay so globally, about 20 to 30% of species will be at increasingly high risk of extinction, possibly by year 2100, as global mean temperatures exceed 2 to 3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Okay. And then also climate change brings floods. Okay. So the ASEAN region is especially vulnerable to climate change since a huge proportion of its population lives along coastlines. Okay. So as you can see, deforestation is also one of the reasons why there's climate change. And according to NASA, forest fires release as many greenhouse gases as all the cars and power plants in Europe in an entire year. So that's how it is. And 9 billion in economic loss caused by forest fires in Indonesia, including health damage from smoke. Okay, so that's how it is. I will not be talking more about the financial state, but I will just talk about the effects and the results. So 1% deforestation rate in Southeast Asia from 2000 to 2010, which is lower than 1.5 to 1.7% estimated by the National University of Singapore. So if this continues, the region will lose up to three-fourths of its forests and up to 42% of its biodiversity by 2100. So magkakaingin, if Philippines will still do kaingin, we will expect that by the next few years we will experience the effects of these great changes and of course if we do that deforestation we our animals or we will also suffer from it okay our animals and uh, will lose its habitat and the pollinator activities will be reduced the reductions of biodiversity will happen. And this is something that is scary because if this happens, our livelihood will stop. Our you know, food production will also stop, stop eventually and it will lessen and lessen and the demand goes up. So in economic stability, if the demand is higher than the, then the needs should also meet to the same demand, but somehow, demand is high, then the production is low. So in that case, we will have scarcity of food and water and so many more. Okay, so we have invasive alien species. Okay, this is something that I really don't like, like cockroaches, but they are part of our environment. And it's just that um, it could happen, it could damage also proportionally for our food, okay, food supply and allow them to dominate in the local system if that would happen and there would be some environmental change. So it would be a constraint on environmental conservation, economic growth, and sustainable development. I guess that is very scary too. Okay, another thing is the illegal wildlife trade. Okay, this is over 100 million animals are hunted for bush meat. Okay, can you imagine that? Okay, there's one specific country that eats a lot of things except for chairs and tables. And I would 
not anymore state it but this illegal wildlife trade valued around 10 to 20 billion dollars according to a cn and targets indonesia malaysia and myanmar so the smugglers frequently caught utilizing transport links through thailand and vietnam 13,000 metric tons of turtles shipped into china every year so that's how it is okay so looking at this picture People have impacts on nature, and nature provides services for people. Don't you agree that since we are the ones who needs nature, and nature needs us to protect and to conserve the, what we have and what they are right now. So if we don't act right now, when? And if no one, who? Who will do it for? And I think the change should start in you, in me, in us. So I guess this is important. And I think we should also put that also into teaching and practices, not only through words, but in practice. But that, because that's what I also do. I conserve, I always make sure that I use recycled materials as much as possible. And also, you know, having lunch, lunch box will help you also conserve in our nature because you don't have to use plastic cups, papers, plastic cellophanes, or anything. You just use your own. Okay, so humans are both the problem and the solution to biodiversity loss. So as a problem, irresponsible human practices contribute to biodiversity loss. But as a solution, humans have the knowledge and expertise, you know, financial resources to conserve biodiversity. So... The question is, what can youths and schools do to conserve biodiversity if we are the main cause, the main problem, but the main solution as well? Okay, so what can schools do? First is, we have to integrate biodiversity lessons in appropriate subjects. But since uh, now we have here in our pandemic time, can we still integrate this? Yes, we can still integrate this at home. So when we conduct school activities, you integrate it at home. You promote biodiversity at home. You know, in their homes and communities, this also starts. Remember, uh, the first teaching starts at home. And as parents, as, you know, as teachers, you should always tell them that to take good care of ourselves is to take good care of our environment and that's how we should tell them always so how do we do that and what practices can we do first conserve water and electricity recycle reuse clothes paper cans glass plastic bottles anything you can actually plant plants flowers in your area if you have some you know plastic bottles or plastic cans that are broken or even rubberized tires you can also plant in them Adopt simple lifestyles like consume less and produce less garbage, okay? Avoid from the production of too much garbage. Dispose waste properly. Bio, non-bio, plastics, you know, cans, bottles, dispose them properly. And then the most important thing is you eat together. Because when you eat together, there is less consumption of food because you can divide your food consumption properly, right? Okay. Also, you have to educate yourselves on which species of seafood are under threat and avoid buying them, please, because you are one of the factors that they are being hunted because you are eating them. So avoid buying them. If there's no buyer, there's no production, okay, of the of the product or of the species of seafood or that kind of food. Buy products with less packaging. Avoid using plastic bags. What I do is I bring my own bag. I have my bio bag every time I go to the market. And that's the bag, the only bag that I put everything. For fish, of course, there's plastic, right? But what I do is when I go home, then wash the fish, the plastic, I wash it, dry it, and then that's where I will also put the 
okay, the other trash that I have so that it will not be of useless. So somehow it can still be used for putting other plastic garbage in there. So it would take time for it to, you know, to be full. That's what I do. So grow our own fruits and vegetables and eat less meat because meat reproduction requires more inputs and energy. It produces a lot of methane in the atmosphere. So if there's too much cows, there's too much methane produced every year. When buying, choose appliances with high energy efficiency ratings. Use fluorescent lamps. That's very practical. Um, most common right now are LED. Actually, the LED lamps can also have lesser consumption of electricity compared to fluorescent lamps too. But you just make sure that the capacity of the lamps that you're buying are also observable in terms of its quality. Okay? Okay, so you have to use social networking such as Facebook to promote biodiversity conservation like what I'm doing right now. I'm promoting biodiversity conservation to many YouTubers who are watching right now. And I hope that you can appreciate the value of conserving. This is very important. So please do follow. Next, you can walk or do a bike or do a carpool. Join ride, but do not also go over the board of too much enjoying while riding. Okay, so follow the strict protocols of our land transportation. So I actually do biking every time I go to school when I'm not stressed and I'm physically fit and I'm physically okay. So I go for a walk, I go for a bike. So write about biodiversity conversation or conservation in school paper so that it will be published, somebody will read it, somebody will appreciate it, and somebody will put it into practice, hopefully. Okay, report environmental crimes to DENR if you are eligible enough. But if you're, you know, a child, you can also do some reporting. Use your Facebook page. It helps a lot. Okay. Conduct or join environmental contests. Volunteer, Bantay Kalikasan. I am um, a volunteer before of Bantay Kalikasan and we've been into, in college, we've been to many kinds of programs where we encourage college students to plant trees. Yes, and also for cleanliness, promotion of cleanliness in the area, in the WIS area here in Davao City. So write to government officials if possible, if you needed some help and some uh, assistance. And of course, plant trees. This is something that is very common. Okay, so something that we need to know, why do we have to plant trees? Of course, if you plant trees, it purifies our air and water. It provides us food, timber, and medicine. It provides outdoor recreation, education, and ecotourism. And tree generates 31,000 $250 worth of oxygen provides 62,000 worth of air pollution control, recycles 37,500 worth of water, and controls 31,250 worth of soil erosion. So join the green wave and do your best for it. Okay? Plant trees, one school, one tree, one gift to nature. So the Green Wave is actually a global biodiversity campaign educating children and youth about biodiversity. And I hope that even at home, you're also planting. So on May 22, usually students around the world count down at 10 o'clock a.m. local time when they will water their tree in their respective schoolyards. And we will have a figurative Green Wave starting in the Far East and traveling West around the world. Okay, students plant locally important tree species in or near their schoolyard. Ideally, the tree species should be indigenous where possible. The trees should be planted on May 22, the International Day for Biodiversity. So don't you know that we have that day, May 22? Please put it on your calendar. It's the International Day for Biodiversity. And you may plant in another month but still hold a special ceremony on May 22. 
So throughout the day, students can upload photos and text summaries in the GreenWave website. So this is their website. So you can upload there and you can join also in the Green Wave movement. That is all for my webinar for this afternoon. And thank you so much. All right, let's go back here and remove. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's it. And thank you so much for watching and listening to this webinar. I hope that it helps somehow and I hope that you learned something. This webinar is intended for educating ourselves and to bring back also the important notes on environment conservation and protecting our biodiversity. Thank you and this is Teacher April or Teacher Apps saying there's always a little scientist inside you. Bye! <laughs>